So thank you very much for that um, introduction and for everybody making effort to come here today. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge, first of all, that this book is very much a group effort. And so I'm only one of the authors that's the only one that's shown up today. But the other editor is Josh Reno, and it's also an edited collection with um, chapters by Georgina Stewart, Sherard Chari, Michael Edwards, Michael Ralph, Gustav Peebles, David Pedersen, and an afterward by Bill Maurer. And this, pro this book is also the product of many conversations that we had in this group and a wider group of people who came to the workshop that led up to this publication. So I'm going to start off uh, talking for about 40 minutes about where the idea came from, how we pulled the book together, and our main findings. Um, so a lot of this, I co what I'm about to present, I co-wrote with Josh Reno, and um, he would have loved to come here today, but due to time uh, zone differences, he just couldn't. So I'm going to start off with the specifics of why I got involved in this project to begin with, but then I'm going to open up with our main conclusions especially those that Josh and I came to through our systematic reading of David Graeber's books. So for those of you who don't know, this is a public seminar. Anyone can come, even people who have no idea about anthropology. So I'll just say, explain that David Graeber was an author and an anthropologist. He wrote or edited over 15 books and numerous articles. In total, the books alone amount to about 5,000 pages of text. So at the speed I read, that was that's equivalent to about six weeks full-time work to read those if you could get six weeks without doing any emails at all. So few would deny that David Graeber is one of the most influential anthropologists of this century, um, at least that we've seen to date. But very few people could really put their finger on why, um, because often these books that he was writing were long, and he would spend hundreds of pages going over details that seemed at times quite obscure um, in unfamiliar societies and would often engage with long dismissed uh, theories from forgotten academics. But uh, maybe his influence is his ability, which is pretty rare, to com combine activism and anthropology. And also, strangely, his ability to speak to a very wide audience, despite the sometimes obscure nature of his work. So our book is the first that we know of to attempt to discuss uh, Graeber's work comprehensively. This is not a biography and it's not an assessment of his life or David the man. We touch on his life only in the introduction as in the context of uh, putting his books as they emerged in the context of the arc of his career. But above all, our book, As If Already Free, is an account of his contributions to anthropology and a demonstration of how other scholars have built on these contributions. So I want to begin by telling you a bit about where this book came from. And to do that, we need to click through my PowerPoint slide. And we need to go back <laughs> in time, in the way back machine, a journey to the past to 2020. And it was an awful year. I think we can agree. Let me give you a refresher. Scott Morrison is Prime Minister of Australia. Climate change is delivering devastating fires and surging storms. And a mysterious virus is killing hundreds and then thousands and then millions of people. And around the world, we were experiencing lockdowns and toilet paper shortages. And Donald Trump, who is the, at this time, president of the United States, was calling it the China virus and ruling over a nation divided by racial violence. And he gets the virus and yet does not die. And the Oxford Dictionary word of the year for 2020 is doom scrolling. So that year, I was teaching Introduction to Anthropology at the University of Sydney, and I had never delivered a lecture online or a tutorial online, and now I was doing it three to four times a week in a small gap between the piano in my lounge room. And my two kids, aged four and six, were part of the mix, intermittently, depending on whether school was in lockdown or not. And in this context, it seemed perfectly fine to me that I would be having work meetings at, on Zoom at 10 p.m. at night or 6 a.m. in the morning, because at least that way the kids would be asleep. And amongst these odd hour meetings that I was having were, were with Josh Reno and David Castle and Jamie Cross about the anthropology, culture and society list at Pluto Books, because um, we wanted to, in the context of COVID, they'd had a severe drop in sales. And we also just had to face the, the awfulness of what was going on around us. We wanted to rework the vision for the series to somehow publish anthropology that contributes to the challenges of our times written in lively, easy to access language, and engaging readers both inside anthropology, but also outside the discipline, including activists, 
all the time staying true to anthropology's roots in attending to diversity and everyday struggles. So it was in the middle of these discussions that news spread around the world in September 2020 that David Graeber had died. And in my case, and I think this is true for the other authors um, that, that eventually gathered together in this collection, it was that we had, I had a really strong reaction to the news. And looking back, I can see now that in some shape or another, I was going through the five stages of grief for a couple of years before I really integrated this and accepted the news. At first, there was disbelief. When I first heard that he had died, for some reason, my first thought was, oh, well, this is going to be a hoax. Like, why would anybody have this as a hoax? But that was my first thought. And then my next thought was that I was really angry that the virus had killed him, him of all people, when other people had lived. And still to this day, he's the only person I know for, that I met personally who died of COVID. And I also felt really sad. I remember driving my son to school and this was weeks after David died. And I just started, like tears just started coming out of my eyes. And my little son said, are you crying about your friend again? And I was like, yes, <laughs> because he knew that somebody I knew I, that, that I cared about had died. And all of this might make you think, wow, Holly and David must have been really close or something, but we weren't. I met him at a conference in 2011 and we worked together on a couple of things. And I was a fan of his early works like Fragments and, um, and his book on value. And I'm really pleased that I had the chance to tell him that while he was still alive. So we were in touch again now and again, but to be honest, and I don't want to sound really cold or anything, but I was surprised at how sad I was that he had died. Um, and I just kept thinking about his work and, and connecting it to everything that I was going through at the time in my life. And I think this is what psychologists call the bargaining stage of grief, where your mind just works and works and works over those parts of the person that you're grieving that, that you do have access to. So in my case, my mind went into overdrive connecting his anthropology to what I happened to be teaching in first year anthropology that year and editing the, the series at Pluto. So I realized that I wanted to write about Graeber's legacy and I wanted to publish something about it. And I wanted to do it with other people. I didn't want to do it alone. I missed Graeber as a person and as an anthropologist. And I wanted to share that with other people who knew him. So there are many things who, that people who knew David Graeber miss about him, but perhaps the most remarked upon is the conversation. Almost everybody said, I just am so sad I'll never get to speak to him again. Um, so part of our, our response as a group to, the, to grieving this loss was to reach out to each other for conversation. And because of COVID, um, this was necessarily an online conversation. We experimented with holding what we called a slow workshop. So rather than one meeting held over consecutive days, we held a series of Zoom sessions, often at strange hours of the night, sometimes separated by weeks, sometimes by months. So the, the dialogue went on for over a year and the benefit was that it allowed people to participate who otherwise might not have been able to. And the attendees came from different areas of scholarship, different parts of the world, different generations. In the end, not everybody contributed a chapter, but all of them knew Graeber's work and wanted to discuss what it meant and what it could still mean. So this is the table of contents of the book that we produced in the end. Um, I think it was published a couple of months ago, still waiting for my author's copy. So unfortunately I can't show you a, a, a real copy. So through this process, a number of themes emerged, which in the end were taken up in the volume as it is now. Um, I'll just go over those briefly, which is sort of about the, the themes in the volume as a whole. And then I'm going to focus on what we talk about in the introduction specifically. So contributors to the slow workshop often alluded to the politics of education and the academy, sometimes making that the direct focus of their chapters. At the same time, anthropological activism was often taken in the other direction, meaning that some contributors focused on the specific politics of everyday human existence thinking about anthropologists as active humans with actual human lives, not just people who passively study humans in, the gen in general. It was such concerns that had driven us to hold the workshop in the slow <coughs> workshop uh, format to begin with. Thinking and writing for life is in this sense an activist project and one that Graeber showed can make anthropology a vital tool outside of the stuffy halls of academic power and privilege. The second theme was an interest in more personal and accessible writing. Graeber cultivated a distinctive writerly voice. 
Uh, sometimes his writing included personal anecdotes, and jokes of varying qualities, and vignettes drawn from the archives. At other times, he appeared to be, at some times, he seemed to be writing for the greatest number of possible readers. And on the other hand, many of his books are rambling tomes that are very hard to summarize. Although he could write in an accessible and fun way, often Graeber chose not to, choosing instead exhaustive detail and long winded recounts of ethnographic observations or old and half forgotten debates. Our slow workshop reflected on but never really explained the appeal of this second writerly style, but many of us had to admit that we do like it. <laughs> um, if there was no single message to be found in this rambling large corpus, there was pleasure to be found there, along with a familiar pattern, an almost mischievous or defiant tendency to bring up hoary and forgotten bits of ethnographic data, long since rendered obsolete, if not right, if not outright politically suspicious, and discuss these as if they were anthropological commonplaces. So this brings us to the final theme of the workshop, which emerged, um, and this arguably moves through all the chapters of the book. And this is the sense of fit between ourselves and the world, at the world as it is and as, and as it could be. Each chapter articulates something about how Graeber's work touched on the author's own life, that sense of both resonance and difference that is the joy of a good conversation, even if this can perhaps never be fully pinned down. So um, next, I'm going to talk about specifically what Josh and I did for this project, which was um, a systematic reading of Graeber's books. Um, so we included all of Graeber's books in this uh, systematic reading, including co-authored and posthumous ones. So these are, um, to introduce you to what we're talking about, this book, which we call The False Coins of Our Own Dreams, which is the title that Graeber wanted for the book, even though the publishers <laughs> called it Towards an Anthropological Theory of Value. We also call it The Value Book. Um, Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropologist, an Anthropology, <laughs> the Anthropology, which is fragmented, not the Anthropologist. Mm -hmm. Remember, <laughs> Lost People, Possibilities, Constituent Imagination, um, Direct Action, Debt, Revolutions in Reverse, The Democracy Project, The Utopia of Rules, we're full, next slide, On Kings, Bullshit Jobs, Anarchy in a Manner of Speaking, Dawn of Everything, and Pirate Enlightenment. So we did include his articles and media reports and other literature, like things in Strike Magazine and stuff, as appropriate. But with the books, our method was systematic. Taking a leaf from Graeber's own playful use of structuralism, we approached his books as a corpus of myth work and thus applied a structural analysis for which we created an extremely large Excel spreadsheet. This is put here for as a joke, but um, we, I, we tried to enter everything in a sort of an arc of the story of his career and also a thematic analysis so we could see how things raised in earlier works popped up again in later books. So, levi strauss's approach to myth turned out to be very appropriate to the daunting task of thinking across the breadth of David Graeber's works. As many have commented, he left an unusually large amount of significant writings, and these are like myths in that they are self-consciously at times stories that he proposed as new truths to guide new possibilities for social action. They're also like myths in that they are sprawling, this is his own word that he used to describe his work, uh, rather than linear in form and intention. As we know, Graeber tends to take his readers on a ramble through ideas, facts, and, and theories. His enthusiasm is consistent, but the landscape is varied. With, the reader is sometimes lost in detail and sometimes led into brilliant, onto brilliant vistas. Like myths, his works are also repetitive. The same quip, the same memorable story is often told again and again, slightly differently in another work. We also believe his works can be treated as myths insofar as they return to and offer a series of different solutions to repeating contradictions. Like, like the workshop, our analysis of his books was a slow process. Um, and this slow process brought the realization that in his writing, perhaps Graeber expressed more than any, what he expressed more than anything was not any kind of statement, like this is what I think, but more a kind of provocative conversation. Hey, what about this? We concluded that the overriding approach of his anthropology was dialogic. His two ethnographies are dialogic. He only wrote two ethnographies in all of 
uh, writing. He, uh, he concluded, um, no, his, his two ethnographies are dialogic in the sense of containing very long accounts of dialogues and discussions. So his two ethnographies are Direct Action and Lost People. And they're very big books, both of them. And Josh and I agree, both agree that they're actually very hard to read because they contain just pages and pages and pages of dialogue. Um, and yet these were the books that David himself was most proud of. His more popular books, even if they aren't written literally in the style of dialogues, also retain his commitment, I believe, to dialogue, but on a more theoretical level, such as his repeated defense of the viability of collective decision-making, if only open discussion were truly facilitated, or anthropology as a potential contribution to ongoing conversations, and the power of these conversations to genuinely change people in the world. Even books even his books that are largely works of history, like Pirate Enlightenment, Dawn of Everything and Death, are dialogic in the sense that he argued that people throughout the world and throughout time are worth listening to with ideas worth taking seriously and ideas that really have changed the world, which is the, essentially the argument of Dawn of Everything and Pirate Enlightenment. Dialogism also characterised his understanding of humanity. He consistently argued that human beings always retain their capacity to surprise you. He saw people as capable of in, intentional social change, creativity and unexpected solutions, or as he glossed it in one of his earlier books, possibilities. This understanding reflects a model which was dominant in United States anthropology, where a basic characteristic of being human on a group level is the capacity to generate strikingly different cultural concepts and practices, and that these can be very difficult for an outsider to understand. <coughs> Nonetheless, understanding is possible, at least for some people, some of the time. Where Graeber differs from this dominant view is that he also suggested that individuals themselves are no less capable of generating radically new concepts and practices. And this means that in any given context, no matter how much is assumed and shared within the group, there will also be room for dialogue between its members. We might say that his dialogism assumed both that underlying commonality made conversation possible and that difference made the conversation interesting. He was fascinated by the idea that what we apprehend as cultures might actually be the effects of social movements of cultural refusal. Mm -hmm. For instance, he was very influenced by Marcel Mose and speaking favorably of Mose, he noted, Algonquians in Alaska refused to adopt Inuit kayaks despite their being self-evidently more suited to the environment than their own boats. Inuit similarly refused to adopt Algonquian snowshoes since almost any existing style, form or technique has always been available to almost anyone. He, Marcel Mose, concluded that cultures or civilizations are based on conscious refusal. Cultural creativity is a possibility he held in any context and thus a way of understanding the fact that we see anthropologists that is cultural diversity. At another level of, so that was his, one of his main explanations for why we see so much diversity. It's not just, oh, it just grew organically, but actually people choose to live differently and differentiate themselves from others at a, and, and maybe from themselves in the past. At another level of abstraction, however, his analysis of cultural diversity was aimed not only at grappling with the dynamics of how any given practice or concept made sense in its own context, but also at identifying the significance of cultural diversity for overcoming current day ethnic centric assumptions in relation to some uh, important themes such as debt or the political malaise or intellectual stagnation. Graeber dedicated himself to understanding diversity in pursuit of insights that would assist in rethinking human being more generally. That is, it was actually part of his contribution to ongoing cultural refusal and creativity. His dialogism then is rooted in a basic commitment to something like a psychic unity of mankind. Early on, he argued that it was very possible that every language in the world had a word for oppression, or at least had the tools available for making thinkable a concept that links a sense of weight and heaviness to the notion that some people have power over others. He understood oppression as formative of much of what we take to be everyday life. He was fond of pointing out that very little can be explained without eventual recourse to admitting that ultimately, things like property rights and public conduct are backed by the sanctioned use of violence. While oppression explained a lot for Graeber, he always viewed people as able to think critically about and beyond oppression. 
While such thought can lead to familiar debates about freedom and equality for Graeber, domination is more fundamentally about what it does to human creativity. His insistence on an underlying commonality in human experience was not simply a rejection of cultural relativism. It was a defense of and an attempt to widen the space for human creativity. He was scornful of approaches that assumed it was only theorists or academics who were capable of making critical assessments of any given situation. He believed that all people had creative potential, not only for providing commentary on their own lives, but also for imagining the world anew. Misfits, unconventional figures, clowns and oddballs are a recurring figure across Graeber's books. In Graeber's first ethnography, he described eccentrics and oddballs, the ones that he met in Madagascar, as both the main way we define what we consider normal and also a reservoir of possibilities during moments of change. In his later books, like Value, Possibilities, On Kings and Dawn of Everything, he talked about clowns, and in the latter in particular, about people ca categorised as having non-normative bodies. He argued that these form a kind of reservoir of diversity that some societies turn to in times of social change for new ideas and for leadership. This, he was here rehearsing an argument originally made by Paul Braddon in relation to the tolerance of sceptics among the Winnebago and by T.O. Beadleman about the importance of bulls in New Orleans. Over the course of his career, it was increasingly clear that he himself identified with his persona of the oddball, who nonetheless provides the inspiration needed for a social movement when the time comes. In one of his posthumously published books, he quipped, they are probably who we'd be if we happen to have been born as turn of the century newer. In Utopia of Rules, he suggested that bureaucracy, uh, the rise of bureaucracy had eroded the space in which oddballs and eccentrics could live in peace with a concomitant decline in innovation. We might say that part of the direct action he himself took against the war on imagination was to himself be a misfit, an oddball and eccentric, insisting on pointing the way to other social possibilities, precisely at the point of history when we were supposed to have stopped believing that revolutions were possible at all. Mm -hmm. Graeber also pointed to reservoirs of possibility in everyday life for all people everywhere. He developed the concept of baseline or elementary communism as a way of describing the vast majority of social interactions, even in societies that consider themselves to be governed by capitalist principles. He defined mythic communism by contrast as the idea that true communism lies either in the very distant past, some kind of Garden of Eden, original perfect state, or in the very distant future through the heroic efforts of social engineering or a great leader. For some, mythic, uh, communism is mythic in the sense that even if it was realized in the current day, it would never work anyway because it's somehow contrary to human nature. In place of mythic communism, Graeber conceived of communism as a very everyday concept, here with us already in the small gestures of everyday life. And he called it the foundation of all human sociability. Communism is the collaboration people show when working towards a common goal, even if they are working towards that goal for Goldman Sachs. And that baseline level of mutual aid, which is shared, which is a shared expectation of everyday life and without which everything else will grind to a halt. Graeber also saw um, an affirmation of possibilities in the mere fact of seasonality. The seasons and the way we adapt our lives to them now as ever, remind us that we do move in and out of varied ways of being. He saw rituals this way too. He saw rituals as laboratories of social possibility and play so fundamental to human development itself tends to throw up possibilities. What begins as free, free play often generates its own rules and could be the beginning of a game which solidifies into a new arrangement. Graeber was not opposed to rules despite his reputation as the simplistic reputation that he had maybe earlier on when I first met him as somebody who bucked all of the rules. Um, he actually saw them as an inevitable part of everyday human experience and a necessary part of any play that remains fun for any more than a few minutes. His vision of freedom was not a freedom from rules, but rather a freedom to choose the rules one lives by and to live in awareness that one has that potential to choose and knowing that new rules could always be erected and the old ones torn down. This processual view of human being, um, he once described as Heraclitian, assumes that what is most essential about human beings is not what they are at any given moment, 
but about what they have the capacity to become. Graeber's approach to political theory was also informed by dialogism, but not exactly the same as that which shaped his account of humanity. For instance, Graeber argued for the possibility of political pleasure, by which he meant the realization of a democratic yearning, which he thought was widespread throughout cultures and among individuals, not something the preserve of the so-called West. He felt there was a widespread yearning for a politics where humans are fundamentally equal and allowed to manage their collective affairs in an egalitarian fashion. Notably, democracy for Graeber is not an invention of the West. In fact, it has been practiced by many people in different times and places. Furthermore, it's not defined by majority voting, professional politicians, heroic competition, or the existence of political parties. For him, democracy involves collective deliberation on the principle of full and equal participation. So dialogism again. Graeber was particularly interested in consensus decision-making as a path to democracy. For him, consensus didn't require bringing everyone round to holding the same point of view, and much less was it about forcing everyone to agree. Rather, he understood consensus as a process, and this term is critical, in, especially in his ethnography, um, direct action. The process starts out by assuming that there will be differing and perhaps incommensurable views in any gathering of people. And this difference is approached not as a problem to overcome, but as a potential that's useful for solving a problem. He argued that consensus, consensus decision-making or actually any collective decision-making is most effective when it's aimed at an action, like trying to solve a problem or address an issue. Consensus-based decision-making involves organized deliberation where different views can be worked out such that the creative potential inherent in the diversity is unleashed. Critically for him, um, to unleash this creative potential, there has to be no threat of force or oppression. The pleasure of politics for Graeber resided precisely in that moment when you're in a collective decision-making uh, uh, context and you feel yourself give way, not because you've changed your mind, but because you've decided it, it's not the most important thing. So this is an idea that first appears in his writing uh, in words attributed to a woman called Jessica, it, uh, who's a direct action network member. And she said to him, there have been times when I've been at meetings and there's a proposal I didn't even like all that much. But over the course of the discussion, it became obvious that just about everyone else thought it was a really good idea. I found there's actually something kind of pleasurable about being able to just let go of that, realizing that what I think isn't even necessarily all that important because I really respect these people and I trust them. It can actually feel good, but of course it only feels good because I know it was my decision and that I could have blocked the proposal if I really wanted to, but I chose not to take myself too seriously. By contrast, Graeber des described majoritarian decision-making as largely unenjoyable noting that most people in our so-called democracies never get to experience politics as a pleasure. Instead, they experience entrenched positions, competition and conflict. Majority decision-making tends to produce great men who have their groups of followers who are locked into endless struggles. Graeber developed a detailed account of sectarian groups in his ethnography of direct action. Sectarian groups feature hierarchical organization, a charismatic leader who is invariably male, a theory, which is the reason for the group's existence, and the production of position papers applying that theory to virtually any topic imaginable. These position statements are printed in a newspaper, which the party members are duty bound to sell. That's certainly true of Sydney. I don't know. I haven't seen them around Geelong. <laughs> this is very much an etic description. He notes that no one identifies themselves as a sectarian. This is instead how sectarians were described to Graeber by the anarchists who he was doing his ethnographic study of, many of whom had first-hand experiences of participating in cult-like sectarian groups before coming to anarchism. A curious but compelling dimension of Graeber's political anthropology is that his radical approach was premised on an occasional impatience for those people within anthropology who question the politics of ethnographic representation itself. Uh, this is a concern that flared up in his graduate years at Chicago and again towards the end of his career with Ho, Ho Talk. In those moments, he seems to have felt that something important was going to be lost if, for instance, Fraser or Lowy or Evan, Evans Pritchard's descriptions were thought to be of no value except as bad examples of unethical conduct or outmoded research or writing. 
But at the same time, that said, he was very skeptical of great man readings of intellectual history. He used his understandings of how sectarian groups operated uh, to, to sound a warning about the role of vanguardism in, ac in academic work, including anthropology. In a memorable lampooning of the uh, Department of Anthropology at Chicago, where he gained his PhD, he described what he called a twilight of the vanguard. Social theory had been reduced to little more than belittling, ridiculing, or dismissing what others had said. Listening was only sustained until one could work out which ism the speaker fell into, at which point they, would be, they could be disregarded with impunity. Graeber explicitly likened these to the sectarian groups he had witnessed in activist circles. There was the same cult-like cult -like structure, the same focus on a core figure or leader, and the same robotic production of position papers from the theoretical standpoint. That is the reason for the group's existence. For intellectual work, Graeber advocated instead a model where it should be accepted from the outset that there will be differences and that perhaps these will be incommensurable. But he argued that the point of intellectual work is not to try to convince everyone to come around to your point of view. And when they don't, just ignore them. The point is to work towards some kind of pragmatic goal um, and the values that are inextricable to that pursuit. So this is where he, he, was, he thought that the best intellectual work comes about when it has an activist goal. Um, when working towards a shared goal, he reiterated, diversity of views within a group is a strength. Related to his anti-sectarian approach to academic work, Graeber also wryly repeated Bourdieu's observation that in intellectual work, one knows one's won the game when other scholars start wondering how to make an adjective out of your name. Graeber characterized this as, as a great man approach to intellectual work. Even scholars who might scoff at the idea of a great man approach to history, he noted, still go ahead and trace ideas back to a single man's genius. Foucault, Trotsky, instead of treating ideas as the, as the products of endless conversations and arguments in cafes, classrooms, bedrooms, and barbershops, involving thousands of people inside and outside the academy or party. He noted that it is common for political figures, such as ancestors, martyrs, founders, or institutions, to be far more important after they die than they were when they were living. He argued that mourning is an important part of how people are made with the fact that a person that the person concerned the person who's died can no longer be directly involved in it is itself underlies how much the work of making and maintaining a career is always done by others this work of mourning and making great men out of mere men is often done by social subordinates mostly women and people who are unlikely to have the same work done for them the negation of self in mourning thus has similarities to the negation of self by people who subordinate themselves to a sectarian group or an intellectual vanguard great man theorist. Graeber acknowledged that his idea of political pleasure likewise involved a negation of the self, but the crucial difference here is that it's done in a process where the process ensures that one's freedom to cease playing the game at any point. In creating this volume, we set out by asking ourselves, what is anthropology and activism after David Graeber? How can we offer a response to this question without contributing to a mythical manufacturing of yet another great man? We definitely do not want to find a way to make an adjective out of his name, and we do not want to start a new ism based on his work. Anthropology and activism after David Graeber is more properly um, going to be something dialogic in, in approach placing his thoughts among streams of conversations, inspirations and events and carrying these onwards, particularly towards action aimed at solving some kind of problem. Graeber's dialogic approach assumed that everyone has great ideas, particularly when the right processes are in place to allow these to emerge and to be heard. Through dialogue, groups can produce ideas that no individual would have come up with. In short, a Graeberian approach to anthropology is a contradiction in terms but an anthropology in conversation with David Graeber is thoroughly consistent. Anthropology after David Graeber can be, and we hope it will be, an anthropology carried on by each of us from our own unique perspectives, but with a purpose and in dialogue with one another. That is, it will not be him, it will be us. Activism and anthropology after David Graeber, we therefore argue, is a conversation. We set out in shock and grief about an unexpected death, morning conversations that would not be had with a lost friend. 
the, de the depth of the grief came as somewhat of a surprise. And part of our motivation was the desire to better know what it was we were grieving. What was it that we had enjoyed so much about David Graeber and his work? After all was said and done, what was it that he had wanted to say in all those thousands of pages of text? And the product of this process was itself conversation, the enriching conversations of our workshop and the appreciation of his writings that I now have as a form of conversation. And our volume, as if already free, is offered as another contribution to that conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think that's probably <laughs> um, I thank you so much for inviting me to read and comment on the book too. Uh, I, um, I know uh, originally Chris Gregory was supposed to be uh, able to uh, able to show up, and uh, I'm very grateful to step into his um, uh, his much larger shoes. <laughs> um, but also, I'm really, really grateful to be able to. Uh, respond to a book that responds to someone whose work I've spent uh, so much time uh, sort of pouring over and thinking about. Um, so I, I have to write things down in order to make sure that my words are the ones I want to say. So I've, uh, uh, I've written a few thoughts down. Um, I started off uh, thinking about uh, how much I, uh, uh, how much of this I 